that you're muted. I thought I muted everybody except Teresa. Okay. <laughs> anyway, um, that last year when we started this, um, Tooney Page at Still Point Farm very generously stepped forward to uh, sponsor and that sponsorship is carrying forth this year. And also this year, uh, Lauren Spreiser of Spreiser Sport Horse Elite Club uh, off offered, I didn't even, she came to me, I didn't even go to her to sponsor the expense of the Zoom meetings. And uh, the information on both of these have been sent out with the, the newsletter, but I just wanted to mention that, that Lauren, particularly for those of you teaching and having a business has taken a very interesting approach and where you can take a, behind the scenes look at her world of high performance training and teaching. She has a members only access on social media, a monthly newsletter with training tips and stories and uh, various other goodies. So the link to that is on the email that was sent out to you um, with the information about um, the, the sign up and so forth. Um, I'm Landon Gray, for those of you that may not know, a president of Dressage for Kids. Um, and some people say, well, Dressage for Kids, why are you doing this? And part of our mission statement st says specifically to support programs for adults who in turn educate youth. So this certainly falls in there. We've had almost 150 people sign up from all over. And I want to say thank you to the generosity of mo so many of you who have made a donation to the program. And I know some people have had some trouble signing up um, and either they couldn't put in a donation or that seemed like it wouldn't work if you didn't put in a donation. Um, if you've had a problem, if you didn't want to donate and sort of felt forced to, please let us know. We'll be happily happy to give your money back. Um, but we have with the donations that you all have made, which Dressage for Kids agreed to match, and then a very generous donation from our speaker today, Teresa Davidson. We will have scholarship funds of at least $12,500. Uh, we're probably going to divide that amongst three uh, scholarships. We're still working on exactly um, what the criteria will be, and we will let you know. It will be done at the end of March, so keep your ears open. It will be open to anyone who has signed up for the program. Um, it'll definitely be about um, something to do with education. We're also trying to get to some of the most of the um, topics that you all asked for when you signed up. Um, and um, we may not, we certainly can't get to all of them. And who knows, maybe we'll continue on after the three months are over. Uh, I sent some documents out to everyone after the meeting last week and to new people, I will continue to do that. Um, make sure please that you're muted. You may want, uh, we will have the view for the speaker. Um, no longer looking at each other. And for those of you who aren't used to Zoom, and I can't tell you where it is on a phone, I should check on a phone, but if you go down to the bottom of your page where it says chat and click on that, you'll see there's a, a area on the right side of your screen where you can write questions or comments. I'll keep an eye on that as we go and we'll uh, be taking questions for Teresa from there. So anytime a question comes up, please don't hesitate to uh, write in the, in the chat over there. So uh, I think that's all of the nitty gritty beforehand. And in general, I don't believe in long introductions. Teresa Davidson has offered to speak to us tonight after riding somewhat in the hunter world. She saw the light and started her career as an amateur dressage rider. She's also an educator off horses, a teacher. And I will let her tell you more. So Teresa, thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Linda, for inviting me. Um, my background is that I taught for um, many years um, in a small independent school for children with language-based learning disabilities, uh, dyslexics. 
Um, and I was both a classroom teacher, a one-on-one tutor, and I was a member of the admissions committee as well during the course of my years there, not all at the same time. Um, so my perspective, my experience there um, as a teacher um, of a very clearly defined uh, community and um, as a student writer, those two experiences shape the ideas that I'm going to be presenting to you tonight. Um, and my presentation will be in three parts, an introduction, which I'm halfway through already now, um, a discussion on the adult amateur student, uh, and then a discussion on the teacher's toolbox from, again, my perspective as a teacher in a specialized educational area and as a student of dressage. Um, this school is particularly successful and well-known in its area for many reasons. Um, only four of them, which I will um, list tonight, and really two that I'm going to talk about as they apply, obviously, to our setting. Um, first of all, the school started off with a very clearly defined mission. And I ask all of you, especially the um, instructors with the least amount of experience, take a moment, not now, and think about what is your mission as a teacher? Um, one of my favorite teachers of all times, Maria Montessori, felt that for her, the greatest sign of success for a teacher is to be able to say that the students are now working as if the teacher were not there. So to create students who are independent in the task or the skills that they, um, they endeavor to learn. Um, second aspect about the school's tremendous success is that it has a very comprehensive admissions process. And the admissions process is essentially information gathering about the students that are going to be coming into the program. And I certainly um, feel that this, is, this ought to be a part of the process when um, a teaching professional accepts a new student into, um, into his or her program. Um, you want to determine the goodness of fit, the student, between uh, the student and the program, as well as to determine how best to teach the student. I'm going to be covering that, this aspect, what I'm calling the admissions process, which let's say for our purpose is understanding the adult amateur writer. Um, third reason, the school has a very carefully crafted teaching methodology. That is going to be the nuts and bolts of the third part of my presentation, which is the teacher's toolbox. Um, and then another key feature about the school's success is that it has a very formal um, ongoing teacher training program, um, which I will highlight very, very briefly. Um, so now the second part of my presentation, the adult amateur student, um, all things considered. You've got to identify who your student is. And for the purposes of this, let's I'm going to go back to who I was when I first started writing dressage. I don't think I'm that, I don't think I'm atypical. Um, 40 something year old woman. Um, I did not write as a child. Um, and when I came to my first dressage instructor, so, uh, Glenn, sorry. I'm sorry, this. I thought I had everybody muted. Shall I continue? Yes, continue, Teresa. Okay. Um, I did not write as a child. Um, I had only been writing for a few years and it was not in, in dressage. I came as a hunter writer, as London indicated. I had really no childhood experience in sports. Um, and at the time that I started writing, I also wasn't really, wasn't engaged in any sport. Um, I, I say it because I think this presents a very challenging scenario for, um, 
for a, uh, a, a writing professional to teach. Um, also, what I think is important to realize is that many of the young professionals, and then as they get older, the same for the same reasons, began to learn to ride when they were children. And I think we all realize that children learn to, to learn anything in, in a particular way. And it is quite different from the way adults learn um, when they're learning something new as an adult. Um, and I'm there to just highlight some, what I think are key differences. This is not by any means a comprehensive list and it's, um, it's, it's subjectively devised um, and I'm sure open to discussion. Um, I think when kids learn, I'm also a mother of several children, when kids learn, they're developing their skills through an unconscious physical experimentation. Kids, as little kids, they're always in motion, they're moving their bodies, they live in their bodies. Um, and they're unconsciously working on balance and, and coordination. And they're very playful in this process. You'll see them trying to do little tricks on their bicycles or their skateboards. When an adult comes to a new sport, a new skill, they're riding, um, adults will develop their skill through conscious mental effort as opposed to the sort of unconscious physical experimentation that I think kids engage in. Um, and this effort is both one of gathering information and assimilating it. Um, adults compared to kids were sedentary um, for the most part. And, and we have to consciously develop our balance and coordination. Um, and, and I say a lot of these, what I will be saying about how adults learn, how, oh, my dog just joined me, how adults learn um, to ride because if you only learn to ride as a child, then you don't know what it's like to learn to ride um, when you begin as an adult. I think kids have little to no fear and they're basically not, they're not risk averse, whereas we adults are fearful of, of falling or getting hurt and, and we're more risk averse. And the older we get or the later we come into the sport, um, that aversion to risk increases. And it's something that we have to consciously fight against that tendency. Um, kids in their bodies, again, because they're so playful, they're kind of loosey-goosey. And um, I think we adults, when we start to learn how to ride again as adults, we're kind of stiff and zombie-like. Um, on an emotional level, kids come into the process of learning basically with a clean slate, with, with no history. Um, those of us who come into the sport as 40-something year olds, we got a chalkboard full of history and opinion and um, in some cases some baggage relative to the sport or not. As learners, I think kids are humble by nature. Um, whereas I think adults are prideful by circumstance. And what I mean by that is many of us who have come into the sport of riding by virtue of our age, um, are somewhat too high achieving in other parts of our lives. We've run businesses or owned businesses, held leadership positions in, in, in our job and community, in organizations, in our families. So um, we know that we can have achievements and have had achievements in certain areas. And then you come into writing and um, all of a sudden the, the effort um, certainly calls into question what you thought some of your uh, abilities and achievements were or are. Um, I think for kids, because they're such a clean slate, um, really for them, learning a new skill is not much of an emotional experience. And I have a daughter who rode jumpers as a kid. And, and I asked her the question in a non-leading way. And she was like, no, nothing emotional about that process for me. But because she has followed my journey, she looked at me and said, yeah, I know, very emotional for you. Um, and, and I don't think that I'm unique in that, um, that circumstance. And, and some of the emotions that we bring into the process um, would be some, some negative emotions, would be doubt, lack of confidence, fear of failure, uh, insecurity, and, and so on. Um, when students come, to ride in their lesson or to ride their horses, 
other than their responsibilities as a student at school, they don't really have any other responsibilities or many um, that would distract um, or, or drain them somewhat. Whereas your adult amateur writer who comes to you, she's got demands from work, from a spouse, from kids, uh, from aging parents sometimes. I'm not saying all of us have all of these, but these again are all factors that have an impact on the person that shows up at your facility on any given day. Um, kids have few, if any, um, issues of physical well being, obviously, separating out para equestrian riders. Um, whereas we adults have some physical well being issues, whether it's an, 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 an old injury, arthritis, or at a certain point in time, going through changes in life and how it affects how we feel on any one given day. So I think you need to factor in what the experience of learning to ride as an adult is. And these are just some highlights on it. Um, you'll also obviously need to determine how often your rider rides, um, how often she'll be able to take lessons, um, and whether she owns her own horse or needs to ride one of your school horses. Obviously, if she owns her own horse, is a whole background that you need to become familiar with regarding um, the horse as well as her working relationship with the, with the horse. Um, another piece of information that's important for you to determine is whether or not she is currently engaging in what I would call complementary activities that are going to require her to move her body through space in motion at, um, in, in, across multiple planes, such activities such as yoga, ballroom dancing, skiing, tennis, tai chi. If she's engaged in these activities, that's a plus for her and for you as um, you're teaching with her. The um, next aspect to consider is how does she learn? And um, there's four different pieces to what I'm going to talk about in terms of how she learns. Um, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some basic theories about how humans learn. But step aside for a moment. I think it's very important as well that young professionals um, should study also and should know how horses learn because you can share or should share some of that information with your rider in an appropriate manner um, in the it, during the lesson as the needs arise. Also, it's important for you to know how she learns because you need to be able to determine when she's having trouble with something, is she having trouble with the technical aspect of the task or is she having trouble executing the mechanical aspects of um, the task? So I'm going to talk about um, a number of uh, traits uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to talk about information on both these technical and mechanical aspects of the task that are going to affect her learning. Um, one of them is temperament. You know, we all have, we all have personalities and temperament. And what she brings to the learning experience is going to affect her ability to, um, to learn. And there are multiple measures of personality traits or temperament traits. And I'm just gonna roll through a few of them for you to put in the back of your mind as you go through the process of understanding who this new student um, is. Um, on the factor, and these factors have been named, uh, on the factor of emotional stability, how adaptive is she? How stable is she? How does she face reality? Is it calmly? Is she mentally tough? Or does she react emotionally, get easily upset? Um, liveliness and mood. Is this an enthusiastic person with high energy and, 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 and positive energy and a positive outlook? Or is she somewhat in the learning process? Is she restrained? Does she carry low energy or negative energy? Does she have a negative outlook? All of these traits obviously exist on a range. And what will be helpful to you is to determine where she sits on that range. 
um, in, in, in some of these traits. Um, boldness, it's called social boldness, but it can be boldness in the contents of, of, of working with, uh, with horses. Is she venturesome? Is she uninhibited? Is she thick skin? Or is she timid and hesitant and, and a little sensitive to potential threats? Um, apprehension, on the scale of apprehension, where is she? Is she self-doubting and self-blaming? Or is she self-assured and self-confident? On the scale of openness to change, is she analytical and experimental? Is she flexible? Is she resilient? Is she able to adjust to change? Or does she just want to kind of stick to what she knows? Is she attached to the familiar? Is she what's called somewhat inflexible? Um, Self-reliance, is she resourceful, self-sufficient? Or is she a joiner and a follower dependent, dependent upon you as, as her teacher? Um, is she tense and impatient and frustrated or relaxed and patient and composed? Does, when she's faced with a challenge, does she persist and persevere? Does she surrender and give up? Um, I'd like to discuss briefly um, learning modalities, the ways in which we take in information. We're all familiar, people are visual learners, they're auditory learners, they're kinesthetic, which is movement learners. And we also learn through the sense of touch. However, for learners, one or more of these is going to be dominant, is going to be uh, strong. Someone who's a visual, who's predominantly a visual learner, is going to need to see the information, whether it's in words or in, um, in, 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 a, in a graphic image in order to be able to better process it. That's pretty tough in our sport because lessons are conducted by somebody telling you, speaking to you, using the auditory process. Um, is, is she, does she learn better by doing something, by going out and actually physically moving through the process? Of course, great for our sport. That's what we're doing a lot of is moving the whole body in order to be able to uh, incorporate new information. Important to remember, there's two teachers every lesson. There's you, the trainer, who's using words to communicate ideas, and there's the horse who is using the movement in his body to communicate to the rider as well. And at first, your new riders are going to need to be taught these words that the horse uses to communicate the position of his ears, the set of his head, and his neck, um, the tail swishing or not, the tenseness in his body. You know what they are much better than I do. The important thing to remember is that you need to know whether or not your student can read these messages from the horse. And if she can't, you're going to need to instruct her in that. Um, third factor that I think is important for um, a teacher to, um, to know is how, is, is some components of intelligence that affect learning. Um, and the one that I think is particularly, uh, or two of them that I think are particularly relevant to the process of learning to ride, one is what's called working memory. And that's the ability to keep some information in mind on the one hand while you're simultaneously doing it. And um, uh, the, the idea of, okay, somebody tells you a 10 digit telephone number and you've got to remember that number while you know, you're dialing it. And you know, nowadays with the keypads, it's a lot easier than in the old days with the rotary phones, it actually took longer to dial the number than it does now. Um, however, um, um, sorry, I just lost my little place here. But okay, so working memory. Um, here's an example in our sport. You're asking a rider to ride a turn on the haunches. Well, she needs to remember that while she is trying to get the horse to turn to change direction, she's not, she has to continue to be sending him forward. So that's the concept of holding one piece of information in her mind while she's incorporating another one. Some people, have difficulty with their working memory. Again, these are all skills 
that exist on a, a range. And it's helpful and important for you to be able to identify where she is. I think the single, however, most important aspect or component of intelligence that affects how they're learning is processing speed. And the teacher's biggest challenge is going to be a student who has what's called slow auditory, auditory processing speed. This is a student, someone who has this, is going to be a student who gets overwhelmed with too much information at once. Doesn't remember the details of what she's been told. Um, needs more time to take a decision or to give an answer to a specific question. Um, she needs to hear the information more than, more than perhaps other students do before it gets into her brain and she understands it. She'll have trouble following multi-step directions. Um, these are just some of the, the um, examples of what constitutes a, um, a, a, an auditory processing speed. Um, another thing is what challenges does she have learning? Hopefully um, not many and, um, and, and not to a severe level. I think everybody's pretty familiar with attention deficit disorder. It is a lifelong condition. Some of your adult students may come to you um, living with, with attention deficit disorder. So you need to be able to determine is her range of attention where is it between the range of long and short? Where does she fall in that range? Is it sustained her attention for the most part or does it waver? Is she more or less distractible? There's a concept in schools of the Teflon brain, which is basically whatever information goes in that pan and shuffled around, the brain pan and shuffled around in the kind, during, during the lesson, at the end of the lesson, between when they go home, they, they finish the lesson and come back to you the next day, that pan has tipped over, all that information or a lot of it has slipped out and they come back like as if they never had the experience or the lesson, they forgot. So in, in the applicability in, in our setting is that they forgot the sequence of aids that they needed to use in a skill that they learned the day before or that they're currently working on. If you have someone who has dyslexia, she's gonna have trouble with left and right. So don't even go there. I would say what you need to do is talk about inside, outside, uh, relative to the arena, relative to the movement. Um, there's also the learning challenge of executive functioning, which is a component actually of intelligence. One was working memory, which I highlighted before. Um, a few others that are um, important, I think, to, to make note of. Um, one's called cognitive flexibility, and it's the ability to think about something in more than one way. So let's say you're working with a student and you have her do leg yield in the traditional way, which is you're coming down the long side, you make a turn down the center line, and leg yield off the center line. Somebody who has strong cognitive flexibility skills, when you ask her to then do it the other or another way, which is, okay, leg you from the long side into the center line. Is she going to make that shift automatically to the different demands of the task coming from a different direction? That's a mental flexibility um, issue. There's also, and this addresses some emotional um, uh, responses on the part of, uh, of the learner, which is, it's called, um, it's called self-control or inhibitory control, which is basically you go into your ability to ignore distractions and to regulate your emotional responses to a challenge and bring rational thought to bear on how you're going to respond. For example, um, you're asking a student who's, who's on the long side to come onto a circle, and especially the, the, um, the, the students operating at the lower levels. I mean, it's just, it, you just want to take that right, you're tracking right. You just want to take that right rein, and you just want to pull it, to pull the, the horse over to the right side. And you've got to exercise a tremendous amount of control to say, no, 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 what I really have to do is send the horse forward with my right leg, my inside leg. That is, that is self-control. Self 
Um, and self-monitoring is another component. Some people have no clue what their effect is on others or uh, including their horse um, and, and what they are doing uh, in, in the situation. And then another, the, the final uh, challenge I think to learning is there are people out there who are extremely sensitive physically to some changes in the environment. Some people who will startle when they hear unexpected noises or loud noises. Um, if the light changes dramatically, they'll for a moment be deer in the headlights kind of a reaction. Um, if there's a, um, a, a big change in movement, they'll be thrown off for a moment. Um, so you, it's important that all of these aspects that affect learning are ones that you are aware of um, and, and that you take them into consideration as you're um, working with your student. Um, there's a saying in the LD field, which is if we can't, if they can't learn the way we're teaching them, we need to teach them the way they can learn. But you can only do that if you know how they learn. And which is why I feel very strongly about the importance of getting to know, um, getting to know your student um, as a learner. Now, you also need to find out in this process of incorporating a new student into your program, um, what, what you can do. Now, knowledge as well exists on a range. Um, take, for example, let's take the leg yield, for example. If she's heard of a leg yield, and she could say, yeah, it's a forward sideways movement. All right, that's a very superficial understanding of a leg yield, but, but, but it is a leg yield. If she can describe its purpose, that's a deeper level of understanding. If she can say to you what the aids are and what combination and what sequence, that's an even deeper level of understanding. If she can identify challenges in riding it or errors that are likely to occur when riding it, how to overcome those challenges and correct them. Now she's evaluating the quality of, uh, of the movement. Um, if she can suggest a situation in which, uh, other than when you tell her to do it, in which executing a leg yield might be helpful. Let's say you've got, you're in an arena with somebody else and she's coming onto you, onto your line of travel. Well, you know, you're not just going to grab a rein and try to turn the other way. You can just execute a leg yield. So that, that represents an even further depth of understanding of, of the, uh, of a leg yield. What's your competence level now at doing all of this? You'll have students come to you or a particular task you'll ask them to do. Then number one, they don't know how to do it. Number two, they don't even know they don't know how to do it. Um, they'll evolve. At a certain point, they know that they don't know how to do it. And they know that they want to do it. Um, and as they start to do it, they're making a whole lot of mistakes. But the mistakes are teaching them and, and helping them progress through these levels of competence. Um, then you've got a student who will understand something and knows how to do it, but it takes an awful lot of practice, an awful lot of practice to demonstrate mastery of the skill consistently. There's a lot of conscious involvement. She's really thinking very hard about how to do it uh, because she understands what the requirements are and she desperately wants to be able to do it. And then you've got the pinnacle of competence, of course, is that the person has so much practice with a particular skill that this skill becomes second nature to them. And um, they can perform it easily. They can do it while they're doing something else. You know, ride a half pass, and uh, a professional could be riding a half pass someplace and see a student in the arena and call out to them and make a comment on what they're doing. I mean, that's such a high level. Of, of, of competence. And that's, I think, the, the it, not I think, I know it is the pinnacle of competence. An example of that would be us driving a car. We're very, very competent at that. And God knows some of us could eat while we're driving a car. We can um, telephone, have a conversation while we're driving a car and still manage to do it well. Um, 
Another aspect about what she can do is what physical um, factors are affecting her learning. Um, you have people out there, I mean, we, we think in terms of right-handed, left-handed, well, there's people who are ambidextrous, which is gifts, of course. And then there are people who have what's called mixed dominance. Um, these are people who actually have a parent who's a lefty, a parent who's a righty, and maybe there's a lot of lefties in the family. And of course, most people are righties, but there are people who can perform certain tasks as well as any lefty, even though they're a righty. Um, and other tasks, they can only perform as a righty, and that mixed dominance can have some impact on some of the physical skills that she needs while she's writing, whether it's a particular movement or executing a particular um, figure. Um, and certainly gender has its effect on, um, on writing. The male pelvis is different from the female one and that affects the position of the writer's leg. It, it affects the, um, the flatness or the arch in the back. It certainly affects um, the location of the stirrup bars in a stirrup. These are all things you know, but does your student know them? Um, and, and the fact that they affect it, and because the more the student knows about herself as a learner, the more that she can try to work with the body that she has. And I know I'm saying she, of course, there, there are men who will come to, to, um, to the sport as new learners, um, but since the majority are, are, are women, that's why I'm saying, uh, I'm saying she. And another thing that's important to understand, and again, many of you I'm sure know it, but the whole concept of proportions um, in the human body, the length of, of the writer's torso relative to the length of her legs, the length of the upper arm relative to the shorter arm, uh, to the lower arm rather, and the same thing with the legs. All of these have impact upon the, uh, the connection that the rider has in the saddle has impact on, um, uh, on the amount of weight that her hands are going to put on the reins if she has a particularly longer arm. The longer body they are, the harder it is to gain and maintain control of the torso and all of the movements. And um, if your rider comes to you with, with her own horse, well then you have to factor all of these things in the confirmation of the horse's skill level, the temperament, the soundness, the suitability of the horse, all of that's going to affect her performance. So these are all things that you need to be considering as you're making your early and repeated observations of your student. Um, hopefully your student comes to you and if she doesn't, you should, uh, you should certainly be speaking to her about her motivation and her goals. I mean, what, what brings a 40 something year old woman uh, with zero riding experience into the sport of dressage in the first place? What keeps her there? What keeps her working with you in particular? Um, the goals that she has, there's, there's a, um, an acronym called, they should be SMART goals. Um, I'll just list them. There's a ton of literature out there about them, but your student, if she doesn't have a goal, then she's just kind of wandering through the process. Um, the goals should be specific. They should be measurable, achievable, relevant, uh, both to the present and the future, time-bound, evaluated, and revised. And before we move on to what I'm calling the, um, the, the tools, the teaching tools that um, are important, um, I would ask you to ask yourself, what is it you think you're teaching when you go out there every day? Um, my answer is you're teaching so much more than a set of skills for writing dressage. Um, you're teaching a new language. You're teaching a foreign language. It's one that's spoken with the seat of the pants and not the mouth in her head. It's a language of weight and not words. Consider all that that implies in the process 
of, of, of your um, instruction. Along the way, you're also hopefully teaching your student to be a good observer or listener, or both. Teaching the student how to learn, how to problem solve, how to set standards and goals and evaluate progress towards them. Fortunately, in our sport, we have the training scale, we have the USDF levels. It's a very structured system. So setting standards and goals and evaluating the progress towards them is made that much more easier by the presence of these, um, these parameters. Um, so the third part of the presentation, the teacher's toolbox. I came up with my list of my top 10 of 10 ways in which good teachers teach. Um, and what I would like to start off by reminding you is, or advising you, um, is that the time that you spend on teaching a student should be greater than the time that's allocated for the lesson. So if your lessons are 45 minutes, if you're only spending 45 minutes teaching that student, you're leaving so many other opportunities um, by the wayside. Um, top 10, number one, good teachers learn about the nature and needs of their students. I just covered all of that in the previous section. A good teacher constructs a comprehensive lesson plan. Lesson plans based on goals and the intermediate steps to get to them, the objectives. It's within the context in our sport um, of the training scale, specific to the levels, uh, US, let's say USDF levels. It takes into account the nature and needs of your student, all of, many of which I've discussed um, up until this point, as well as taking into account the student horse combination, it takes into account what you're working on with the student, what she's struggling with. Essentially, a good teacher is constructing an individualized educational program for each of her students. Um, so there goes, you're already way beyond the 45 minutes of the you know, traditional lesson time. Three, a good teacher executes her lesson in a systematic manner. Um, before I talk about the systematic manner, bears reminding that it's important to create a learner-friendly environment for the student. We know that when a horse is stressed, it cannot learn. Let's remember that when a student is stressed, she cannot learn or she cannot learn well, or she'll forget what she learned by the time she gets home. Um, systematic matter of teaching always in includes a review. You're reviewing the work that's been done and the foregoing days. And you also need to be reviewing some key concepts. The concepts that you review are going to depend upon um, the level, how you're, the, the level of, 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 of skill and knowledge of your student. But um, many of those include important key concepts that should be talked about or this, you should make sure your student is aware of is, for example, a warm up. Why do we warm up the horse? How do we warm up the horse? What is the true purpose of the warm up? What parts get warmed up and why? The circle of energy. Where does it begin? Where does it travel through? Where does it end? Of course, it's a circle, so it's continuing, continually moving. Um, the concept that the energy level of the student affects the energy level of the horse. The posture of the student affects the posture of the horse. Half halt. The purpose of a half halt. It's an, that concept bears reinforcement all the time, needless to say. Also, however, the execution of a half halt. Depending on which books one is reading, a half halt, the rain aid part of the half halt, I'm not talking about using the seat, using the legs, I'm talking about the rain part of the half halt. It's variously described as you're squeezing the reins, you're flexing the wrist. Some people describe it as vibrating the rein. 
the rain with the ring finger. Others describe it as a scramble the eggs motion. How do you define the rain aid portion of the rain aid? I mean, of, of the half halt. Make sure your student knows that, especially if your student has perhaps come to you from somewhere else, or if your student is someone who maybe spends some time with you and some time riding with someone else. Um, there needs to be a consistency. If someone else is one of your assistants, then there needs to be consistency in how you and your assistant trainer are describing um, this. Um, the rider should be aware of signs of acceptance of the bit and the horse bracing against the bit. Another important concept is the concept of balance. What are the signs of a horse who's in balance? What are the signs of a horse as he's losing balance? Um, and probably the single most important, and I saved it to last, is what is the primary presenting problem of the student? What do I mean by that? What's their biggest, biggest issue that they have? And everybody's got one. I mean, we have multiple issues, but what's what's the single biggest one? I know for me, um, I have a domineering left seat bone. My left seat bone wants to do all the talking no matter what direction we're going in, no matter what exercise we're doing. My right seat bone is MIA. I know this now. I didn't used to know that, but now that I know it, that is my frame of reference for everything that I think about um, and, and I touch base with each time that I'm writing. Um, a third thing that a teacher, a good teacher does is she introduces new material. Start off, if you're gonna be doing something new with your student that day, start off simply by saying, today we will work on X. Soon as you say that, whatever information book learning she's got, she's already going to be <clears throat> creating a frame of reference with that. Um, use, oh, break down the task into its component parts. For example, what are the aids? What's the combination of the aids? What's the timing of the aids? What's the purpose of this particular exercise? Use precise wording. You know very well that sitting deeply is not the same thing as sitting heavily. Forward is not fast. Relaxed is not slow. Contact is different from connection. Make sure she understands that. Um, give them directions in terms of the action that you want them to take, not the result you want them to achieve. And this is a very important distinction here because it is very possible that she doesn't know what she's got to do to achieve the result. So if you're asking her for a result, as opposed to a specific action, you're not going to get it. So my example with this is, um, if she's doing a free loop serpentine and she needs, obviously, to change from one direction to the other, I think the default might be to say, outside rain, outside rain, outside rain, she goes into the new direction. Of course, this means she's understanding exactly how you define the outside rain half hole. Um, however, if you say to her that move that shoulder, move that outside rain shoulder over to the inside, then she will automatically, rather than trying to scramble the eggs or flex with the ring finger or squeeze or flex the wrist, she will automatically, put my hand in, take that shoulder over simply because you used, you used a very specific instruction rather than a term that's open to a lot of interpretation. Um, use imagery. You, know, you want somebody to be straight, um, the giant letter H, for example. Um, London, I think I'm gonna need two more minutes here. Um, the, uh, the, the, the image of you need a certain number when you're on a bicycle and the bicycle's going forward, you need a certain number of, of, of RPMs to keep that bicycle in balance. Well, the same thing is true with the horse's movement. If, if he's not moving forward enough, then clearly that's going to affect his balance. Um, 
you want to engage as many senses as possible. So by asking the student, for example, to tell you the aids of the next movement you want her to do, she's thinking about it, she's saying it, she's hearing what she's saying. This is involving more um, mental effort on her part than just passively listening to what you're saying. Um, and very, very important, you want to be asking, you want to induce them to problem solve. So you want to be asking questions. We call them in the education field, the WH questions. Who, what, when, where, why, how, how much, how little, how often. You ask those questions and you get her to answer them. That's a lot more than her just doing what you're telling her to do. Um, then you can, an, another thing that you can do with her is you can ask her to basically talk out loud while she's writing something. You say nothing, listen to what she's reporting back about what she's seeing and feeling and what she thinks she needs to do and when she needs to do it and how she needs to do it. So now you've got her asking herself these WH questions and you're taking her from a more dependent learner to a more independent learner. Um, the good teachers are going to employ a lot of supporting material. Um, and in our case, take your typical mounting block. It's not just for climbing on. If you want to have your student get a real sense of what her seat, where her seat bones are, have her sit on a hard surface. So many of our saddles are constructed in such a way, especially for the adult amateurs, that it could be a little uh, difficult to feel where the seat bones are. Have her, sit, have her sit on a horse bareback, even if you're leading her along the way, and let just, just let the horse walk. Let her feel the muscles of the horses that move as it's walking. Have her sit in different saddles and you know maybe do a little walk trot so that she's developing the proprioceptive skills, the skill of knowing her own body as it's going through this exercise. If, you can, if you've got availability of a horse to lunge, that's great. Everybody lunges without stirrups or reins. How about lunging with the eyes closed, given that you've got a horse that you can do that with? Using cones and cavalettis and jumps. Um, how about putting her in a jumping position and with short stirrups to feel the weight of the feet in the stirrups? Provide reinforcement activities. That's uh, another thing that, that good teachers use. Um, let them, you ride, you do teacher show and tell. You ride a horse and you talk out loud and tell what you're seeing and feeling and thinking and what you have to do. Have them watch other students um, in their lessons and to the extent appropriate them ask you questions at the appropriate point in time. They should be auditing clinics and, sh and, and sitting behind, if it's possible, when, at, at, a, at a show when a judge is schooling and dictating to the scribe so that they can hear what it is that are the requirements uh, for that particular test. Um, assign some independent practice, homework, otherwise known as homework. Tell the student one day, you go out and work on your own, but I want you to come back to me and tell me what it is that you learn. And be very specific in the questions that you ask them or the parameters of what it is that they're supposed to tell you. Encourage them, and Lyndon always does this, encourage them to write down, to take notes and write down what it is that they think they learn. It would be great if periodically you could check that. You want to make sure that they understood the concepts correctly. Um, ask them, write down the age for an exercise. Let, let, let me see what they are. Have them draw a test out on paper. They'll have a much better sense of the parts of the test, the, the, the walk tour, the canter tour, the trot tour, um, the connection of the various or the relatedness of the various parts uh, to each other. And videos and photos. One of the favorite things for me is to have an instructor just send me a photo. Doesn't have to be of me or a video. Doesn't have to be of me. It could be of anything or anyone. Don't say a word. 
find out what I think I know about it. Let me respond to that. That will tell you a lot more, again, about my level of understanding. Good teacher evaluates the lessons in the program and revises her goals and strategies according to that. So again, your lesson time and your effort in teaching the student go beyond that one time frame. Um, make sure to get some student feedback. Periodically ask the student, well, you know, what do you think about your effort in learning this particular task? You might be surprised by some of the answers and they might help guide you in, again, how you're going to teach that student. Share, two more points, share your resources. If you have a list of favorite authors, books, videos, websites, post them somewhere for all you students to see. Post what I call graphic organizers. How about a picture of the pyramid of training? Photos of correct position or a series of photos, correct and incorrect positions for people to think about and, um, and, and comment on. Speci photos of specific movements, images. We have a plethora of professionals out there. Sally Swift, Mary Wanla, Suzanne Von Dietz, Beth Baumert's work on the building blocks and the power lines. Uh, Dr. Deb Bennett on, on biomechanics. There are so many. There's, there is a, a plethora of information out there. Put it up in a visual form, especially helpful for your students whose primary learning method is visual. And finally, pursue ongoing professional development. All good teachers never stop learning. To you young professionals, I say, get yourselves enrolled in the, in the instructor certification program because a person can have the best, ho best horse, the ideal um, um, schoolmaster, but if her instructor is at the lower end of the range of her skill set, that student's progress will be different from the progress that a student will make who has a very well-trained, deeply trained um, teacher teaching her, the USDFL education program again. Um, and network with other professionals as well as part of your own ongoing professional development. Uh, so these are, again, my, my ideas on understanding what an adult amateur student's experience is and ways in which you can reach those students and teach those students that will help them become better learners, better rider, better horse people. Lyndon, thank you for inviting me to do this. I have to say the process of preparing this made me think a lot more about my writing and hopefully some of that effort will translate in the saddle on Tuesday and all the days going forward. Thank you. Marisa, thank you so much. We've sort of run out of time, but are you game to stay a little more and answer some questions? Oh, abs absolutely, absolutely, I am. Um, I so I'm gonna go through them and a couple questions I might ask the person who wrote them down to, to uh, cover it. But here's one that a lot of people deal with and certainly not in your case because you've always been very, very physically fit. But do you have suggestions on an instructor approaching the rider who is not fit enough? <laughs> yes, one suggestion is to say to the rider, you know, this is a, 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 an effort between two bodies, the horse's body and the rider's body to do this work. We want our horse to be operating at his highest potential. We feed him a certain way, we turn him out, we exercise him. Consider saying to your student, bringing yourself up to achieve your higher potential as an athlete by doing whatever it is, it is that you want them to do. If you feel that they need to lose weight or they need to have more muscle tone, if they understand that they will be, they will have a better experience if certain basic requirements are met 
one of which in this case, we're talking about a level of physical fitness for the rider. I hope that they will go ahead and pursue that. Um, no guarantee there, but if you put it within the context of comparing their, uh, what they're expecting from the horse, the horse needs from them too. I don't know if that yeah. adequately answers the question. Uh, another question. Um, any suggestions on the uh, help the am the adult amateur who was older than their instructor. We have a lot of young instructors here on here on, mm -hmm. on our call. Sure. And um, you know, do you have any thoughts on having helping the younger ones gain the respect of the older? Absolutely. I mean one thing is the all instructors, regardless of their age, have to carry themselves in a very professional manner. Um, I think it met to me as a student, it matters more that my instructor would be um, deeply committed to his or her own learning, to improving their skill set as a teacher so that I can improve my skill set as a learner and as a writer. Um, I would hope um, that age doesn't matter, but um, certainly the longer a person's around on the planet, the longer a person, the more a person has opportunities to learn, but that doesn't mean that um, the, the young professional shouldn't be trying to learn more. I think the, the student will respect a professional who's indicated um, through what she says and what she does that she's honing her skills every day, just like she's asking you to. I think that means more than, than, than the age. Here's one that from your teaching children uh, younger children might help in teaching the adult amateur who talks back constantly, doesn't really listen, doesn't follow instructions, mm -hmm. likes to hear the sound of their own voice, perhaps. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what do you do with them? Is, is, yeah. is, is that essentially the question? Um, I wouldn't necessarily address it while the person's on the horse. Um, the, the, the relationship, and, and I didn't even have the time to get into this. Um, I, I mean, I didn't even prepare it because I knew I wouldn't have the time to get into it. But the, the relationship between, and Linda, maybe this is a topic for, for um, a, 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 another session, the, the relationship between the instructor and the student um, is, is a particularly delicate one. Um, obviously a, a tremendously important one. Um, I, you know, and, and, and we're dealing adults to, to adults in, in the scenario of this particular question. I would not address the issue when the person's on the horse. I would find an opportunity to, um, to address it um, when they're not. And again, put it within the, put it within the context of learning. I think if something's put within the context of learning, it's not about you did this or you don't do that. It's, you know what, um, you can learn better if, you do, if, if you're listening and here's how you can listen. Um, so if you, you have to take, you have to depersonalize what it is that you say to them at the same time while you're getting across the, the idea of the need of the person to shut up and listen. And if they don't, if they don't, well, I think that tells you a lot about what their goals and motivation are too. And you, at that point, as a professional, you have to make a decision on your own as to how you're going to work with that student. Quite honestly, how much of your heart and effort and brain are you gonna put into the effort? Are you, are you going to put into that student? And that, 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 that's a tough decision, but unfortunately it is a decision that teachers have to make about their students. Super. 
Nicole um, Del Giorno, can you unmute yourself? Because oh. I would like you to ask the question. I don't totally understand it where you started. How would you collect that information? You there, Nicole? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. Um, hi, hi, Teresa, how are you? <laughs> Thank you so much for doing this. I remember Nicole was a very young, young pre-teenager perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> been a long time. Yeah. Um, uh, so my question was, um, you, you had mentioned that you like to collect information about your students, you know, mm -hmm. prior to, uh, you know, how, how they learn, what their goals are, what their backgrounds are. Um, you know, I, I know you mentioned like complementary activities and um, perhaps some, you know, physical limitations that they might have from old injuries or, or health concerns or issues like that. Um, I, you know, I'm assuming it's coming a little bit from your admissions background, and I was wondering, yeah, I was wondering how you typically collect that in a school environment, and do you feel it should be done differently in the context of like a riding lesson environment? Mm -hmm. uh, good question. V very good question, Nicole, um, and thank you for that question. I mean, at, at our school, because it was a... a uh, a school for children with learning disabilities. Obviously, it was the school's mission was basically not to continue the um, uh, the course of failure that the students had been experiencing in the mainstream settings, meaning you know a typical school uh, with typical classroom environment. But rather, the school wanted to be a solution to the problem and did not want to be a continuation of the problem. So it was essential that this or is essential that the school learns as much about the students as possible. And the admission process included um, reports from the parents, which obviously in our case with adults is not um, not applicable. It, it included standardized testing. It included reports from the teachers, um, uh, as well as the students coming and visiting the school as part of the admissions process and doing some informal testing in the school and going through a day and a half worth of classes at the school so that the, the, the student could be observed or the, the potential student could be observed in the environment. Now look, your professionals don't have that luxury. I mean, this school has a long waiting list all the time and it's, and it's heartbreaking. Um, a lot of you don't have that luxury. However, how you can address the issue of learning about your students is to have your own questionnaire. I mean, I remember, and London, I don't know if you still have it um, in any form whatsoever, but I, I certainly remember um, London sending around um, it was either when I first came or maybe she did it every year. I honestly don't remember a questionnaire about that, that she wanted the students to fill out. And it included questions about what our goals were, what your past experience were, et cetera, et cetera. You can devise a questionnaire. Um, and I mean, if, if, if there is any interest, if even one person would like for me to convert everything that I said into a questionnaire form. I'm very happy to do that and, you know, to send it out for dissemination who's, who, for who's ever interested in it. So as you bring on a new student, you can say, hey, you know, I want to do my best job possible. I'd like to learn from you what, what, what I need to know so I can help you be the best learner you can be and, and I can help you um, develop to your full potential. Who's going to say no to that? Teresa, we'd love what if you put something together. And yes, I still use that those sheets for goals for horse and goals for rider at every dressage for kids clinic I do. Very uh, good. Yeah. We have a question. Um, I love this one from Maddie. Um, in the circumstance of a trainer teaching an adult amateur, when you think about all the little things that may be affecting the adult amateur's day, is it the trainer's job to teach them um, through it or the adult amateur's job to check it at the door and continue with the focused lesson? Well, I've always believed, it's, this is her, that it's the student's job to be mentally prepared for a lesson. Easier said than done. That's my comment. 
<laughs> yeah, no, absolutely. I agree with you. Easily said than done. And again, I mean, this is this is an interaction between two people. If the student, if the student is like just beyond herself, maybe that's a day that you say to her, if you have access to a field or even a track around the arena, take a mental health day, go do this, go walk out in the field, um, go on the trails. Now, obviously not everybody has that at their facility. My short answer is, if you wanna get something accomplished, the onus is on both people to do something. Um, it's, if there is a trusting enough relationship between the student and the teacher, if the student respects the teacher very much, the, the teacher needs to say, you know what? I've, I have been told, and I'm sure it won't be the last time, but I have been told, you know what? You don't have the right attitude today. So now the onus is on me to do something about that. And I could either say, you know what? You're absolutely right. Um, I don't. Can I just go, you know, for a walk somewhere or, you know what, how about I get off and we just call it a day and, you know, maybe I'll graze him or something like that. I mean, the, the, the student has to be honest with themselves, um, but you have to be honest with the student as well. And again, the, the, this, this is another component of the aspect of that relationship between student and teacher, which um, I, 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 is so important and I honestly wouldn't wouldn't know where to begin to say where we should go with that. But it, that is that is certainly um, something that, that, that should be um, explored further, that relationship and how to navigate the intricacies of it. If I can add something, Teresa, you're a very, and I've always been a very determined want to become the best you can be student. I think there's a lot of adult amateurs out there who ride more for fun, and in some cases, for their mental health. Mm -hmm. And well, I certainly have had many in the past who, you know, we end up chatting half the lesson because that's, that's where they're at. Mm -hmm. um, and I think part of it is figuring out with your student what, how, you know, maybe that's just what they'd like to do. Do a lot of walking, do some chatting, uh, do a little bit, come back and do a little chatting. Um, exactly. And that's, that goes back to my issue of, or, or, or my, my, my recommendation, I should say, of knowing your student, what motivates her? What does she really want to do? Not necessarily what she says she wants to do. How she, how she progresses through her time with you is going to answer that question. And absolutely, if the student is one who wants to chat, there's nothing wrong with that. If it's clear and her behavior is consistent with that, you know, but if she's been chatting away and then comes back to you and says, well, geez, I can't even do this. You have a perfect right to say, well, we really haven't spent that much time or attention on it. So um, you're absolutely right. I mean, th there is a full range of interests and motivations and goals within the universe of adult amateur writers. And your job is to figure out where this particular, where each of your particular writers stands on that range and respond accordingly. Um, there's a question that, you know, when, when uh, everybody applied, uh, you know, it's that, sent in the application for this program, we asked if there were things you'd like covered. And I don't know if this is something you, you know, I'm looking for you to talk about it personally, um, which is dealing with fear. Hmm. Is that something you've had to deal with in your writing? And if so, is there fear that you have overcome? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't afraid ever of, of anything. Um, let me think of things I've been afraid of. Um, other than, you know, the obvious of, of, of falling. Okay, well, if I'm afraid of falling, I've got to make sure I have to be aware of my environment, my surroundings. I have to make sure that um, I'm not putting myself and my horse in, um, in a situation 
where we will fall. Um, I have to make sure that I maintain myself physically enough fit so that um, if he loses his balance, I have a better chance of not falling off or getting hurt. I had once my 18 hand horse go down on both knees when he stumbled and somehow or another I managed to stay on. I'm like, thank goodness that I worked so hard um, on fitness. Um, I've had to um, sort of, you have to take steps back when, when there is something that you're afraid of and think about what exactly it is that you're afraid of and make a conscious decision about, and a commitment of wanting to overcome it. Um, you have to share that with your instructor. I don't want to do this because I'm afraid if I do it wrong, he's going to just take off and bolt. Okay, well now my instructor knows what's going on in the back of my head and can do something about it. Can, and this is not meant disrespectfully, but dumb down the exercise a little bit um, or take me back some steps where I'm working on maybe a component of that skill. Let's say, I don't know, let's say canter to part on, 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 on a big horse or something. Um, have me do a series of exercises that will simulate the physical demands of doing a canter to part and I'll become more proficient with it. And then it'll be like, okay, okay, now I understand. Now I'm ready to do it and do it. So, um, that would be an example of uh, a, a particular fear and fear of uh, and, and doing something to overcome it. Um, but I think a key component is your students have to talk to you. They have to tell you what it is they're thinking and feeling, which was why I included get student feedback in, um, in my list of, of um, things that a teacher, a good teacher does to help the student. Thank you. Did that adequately answer? Yes, that helps. I mean, it's 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 a bit it's a often a big subject with particularly working with adults. Kids tend to be less fearful. Although I find the kids that are fearful, I have more trouble helping them than the adult. I, I feel I personally I feel better helping adults with fear than kids kids with fear. But anyway, that's a whole other subject. <laughs> more than long enough, and I think. Uh, we didn't cover every single question. There are a few comments in the chat for those of you that are on, you might want to quick read them. And, and there's one about beginners. We're going to be talking about teaching beginners uh, next time. So um, thank you very, very much, Teresa. Um, and you have a lot of thank yous in the comments. I don't know if you can see the comments. I'm seeing some, yes. Yeah. <laughs> So thank you all for sticking with us a little long. I will send out my, what I call my goal sheets. Uh, you're welcome to read them, burn them, whatever. And Teresa, if you put something together, I know we would love it. I'd be very happy to do that. Uh, thank, you. thank you so much. A terrific evening. And uh, we really, really appreciate your time. And thank you all for sticking with us. And thank you all, all of you young professionals from on behalf of all of us older adult amateur writers thank you because you're doing this is is making you a better teacher and we will benefit from that so my kudos to you we also have some not so young professionals on here i'd call them old professionals but well, <laughs> um, i am not surprised i'm i'm honored that they would even Join in on this and um, and uh, grateful again as a student that they're continuing their own professional education in any way that they can. Thank you and good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank You're you welcome. very much. Good night. I don't know how to sign off. <laughs> there's an, if you go to the bottom, I think there's an end, isn't it? I'm going to sign off. That'll end it. Okay. Okay. <laughs>
Oh, leave. Yeah, I guess leave is it. Okay. <laughs> Good night, Landon. Thanks again. Thank you so much, Teresa. It was terrific. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye.